Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan, and in one of our recent videos where we were talking about how crazy A-Wing pilots are, one of you guys commented the following. Am I hearing and converting kilometers per hour to miles per hour wrong? No, my friend, you're not wrong, you're just too used to f***ing winning. But are Star Wars fighters slower than Earth-based modern fighters? So yeah, this is actually something I think about a lot when I'm making videos for this channel. As someone who has directly funded the research, development, and deployment of state-of-the-art fighter jets all across the world as a U.S. taxpayer, I obviously know the maximum speed of most fourth and fifth generation modern fighters, and I also know that healthcare will never be free. And so when I'm doing these breakdowns of Star Wars starfighters, it's kind of difficult for me to say something like, the A-Wing is the fastest fighter in the galaxy with a top in-atmosphere speed of just around 1,300 kilometers per hour or 800 miles per hour, which in the aviation world is... Eh. So in 2020, right before the pandemic hit, I was on a cross-Atlantic flight uh, coming back from unprotected relations with the Pangolin. My commercial airline flight, which was supposed to take seven hours, only took five hours thanks to Cyclone Ciara. It had pushed the jet stream over the Atlantic to close to 200 miles per hour. With that kind of tailwind, the 787 Dreamliner I was on eclipsed speeds of 800 miles per hour, which is basically the top speed of an A-Wing and about 200 miles faster than the Dreamliner's usual maximum speed of 587 miles per hour. They assured us that it was completely safe, despite the fact that we were traveling faster than the speed of sound in a composite body air craft designed by Boeing during its era of bullshit and shenanigans. Apparently what we were doing in that airplane was kind of like getting on one of those moving walkways at the airport. If you guys want to try out this crazy ride, I recommend you book a flight cross Atlantic uh, in late winter, around February. As a matter of fact, because of increasing global temperatures, the jet stream is now getting faster. This year, a commercial liner from Philly to Doha hit like 840 miles per hour. It's actually one of the positive effects of climate change. See, it's all about how you frame things. Anyway, why was I flying faster than an A-Wing in a commercial liner? Why are Star Wars fighters all so slow? Don't believe me? Well, the T-65B X-Wing's top speed is 652 miles per hour. The TIE Fighter's top speed is 745 miles per hour. The Delta 7 Ether Sprite, which is blistering fast, has a top speed of only 782 miles per hour. And the Millennium Falcon's top in-atmosphere speed is 745 miles per hour. If you take a look at modern fighters, a lot of them can reach Mach 2, or 1,500 miles per hour. Even the F-35 can reach 1,200 miles per hour with a full weapons load. Oh, hey. Imagine this is... This is how Anakin felt after Order 66. After he defeated all those younglings. You know, relaxed. Comfortable, worry free. I'm feeling this way thanks to our sponsor for today's video, Helix Sleep. See, I've been sleeping on the same mattress for almost a decade, and I thought it was finally time to get something new. I went online and took the Helix Sleep quiz, answered a series of questions, and they paired me with the perfect mattress this Helix Dusk Lux with a Glacio Tex cooling cover. It's like sleeping on a cloud, it's absolutely amazing. With over 20 unique mattress offerings, including their award-winning Lux and Ultra Premium Elite collections, Helix Plus designed for the big and tall sleepers, and Helix Kids designed by medical experts for the youngins, they basically have all your sleeping needs covered. Plus, they'll give you a 100-night sleep trial to make sure your mattress is perfect for you, and they'll also give you a 10-year warranty along with multiple financing options. Helix mattresses are delivered right to your door free in the United States in a very manageable size box. I was actually amazed just how small they could compress these things. And right now, guys, I have an amazing deal for you. Visit helixsleep.com slash generation tech and use the promo code helixpartner27 to get 27% off of your mattress purchase, plus two free pillows, and receive a free bedding bundle with your Lux or Elite order. Thank you for your patience, guys. Back to the rest of the episode with a much less comfortable hour. So this is actually kind of easy to explain. I mean, it's it's a complex answer, what I'm going to give you, but it is easy to explain and shows us that the lore is a lot more intricate and well thought than we originally realized, which is kind of cool. Despite their insane top speeds, most modern fighter jets cruise at around 600 miles per hour, similar to most airliners, and also close to what most starfighters top out in atmosphere. And that's because of a phenomenon known as a sound barrier, which is very common uh, on Earth-like planets with Earth-like atmospheres, which are actually very common 
in the Star's Galaxy. From Coruscant to Corellia to Alderaan, most habitable planets in Star's Galaxy have a very similar size to Earth and have a very similar atmospheric pressure and makeup. And on these planets, you experience this phenomenon known as the sound barrier when you hit a certain speed, the speed of sound. And this differs depending on your altitude and the temperature of the air. At sea level, it's around 760 miles per hour, and then when you go up higher in altitude to like 43,000 feet, it slows down to 660 miles per hour, and that's because cold air is denser, and so things move slower through it. Breaking the sound barrier is actually not an easy feat, and when Chuck Yeager here on Earth broke the barrier in that tiny Bell X-1 in 1947, it wasn't just about the rocket-propelled engine that got into 700 miles per hour or the high altitude of 43,000 feet. It was also very much about aerodynamics. So when you approach the sound barrier, the air in front of your aircraft begins to compress at an increasing rate, and that increases drag on your entire airframe, and it makes acceleration harder and harder. For all you nut jobs out there on those high buses trying to get rid of the limiter on the engines, the air resistance is what stops you from getting over 200 miles per hour as much as the lack of horsepower to push you through it. There's actually a formula out there that states that the force required to push through atmosphere increases by the cube of velocity. So in a car, you need around 200 horsepower to travel at 150 miles per hour, which means you need about 1,600 horsepower to travel at around 300 miles per hour. That's why the Bugatti Veyron, one of the fastest production road cars in the world, can only hit around 267 miles per hour with a 1,200 horsepower engine. And this is why most cars that break the 300 mile per hour mark at the Bonneville Salt Flats have rockets in them or some other crazy propulsion system paired with what looks honestly like a rocket ship body. So back to the sound barrier. You're pushing against it. There's a compression of air in front of your airframe, space frame. With an airplane, you can increase horsepower to a pretty crazy rate with a jet turbine engine. Although we usually calculate their power through pounds of thrust, most modern jet engines can produce roughly around 30,000 horsepower. So, you do have the power to get through the barrier here. But this is also, of course, paired with an extremely aerodynamic airframe that is designed to eliminate drag. We're talking about features like a swept-back wing, like the F-100 Super Sabre, one of the first production aircraft to break the barrier. Something that you don't see on, for instance, a Z-95 Headhunter. Another feature that you need is a fuselage that is tapered in the nose and in the tail, sort of like a football. Something that these TIE fighters don't have because they have the aerodynamics of a brick. Actually, a brick probably has better aerodynamics. And let's say your plane needs to generate lift for slower landing and takeoff speeds, but you also want to go supersonic. Boom, variable geometry wings like the beautiful F-14 Tomcat. Pride of the uh, Iranian Air Force. The X-Wing also has variable geometry wings, but it clearly doesn't have a swept wing in atmosphere mode. These wings are known as S-foils and are more for heat dispersion to cool down the reactor system. So aerodynamics matter not only because you're trying to cut through that air pressure in front of the airplane, there's also a lot of turbulence building up around your airplane uh, in the form of shock waves. You definitely need good aerodynamics to decrease that turbulence and the effect of the shock waves and a strong frame that can handle all of that jostling around, along with the power to push through it all. So these are very specific design features you need to include in your aircraft design if you want them to go supersonic, which is why all supersonic aircraft kind of look the same, whether it's a Soviet jet an American jet, a European jet, or the Chinese knockoff. It's not just industrial espionage, I mean, that's there as well, but uh, there are only so many ways you can push yourself through the sound barrier. If we take a look at most starfighters in Star Wars, well, the name says it right then and there. These are not aircraft. These are not aerodynamically sound platforms designed for atmospheric flight. These starfighters are designed for a vacuum where the majority of their missions take place. I mean, the TIE fighter is known as a space superiority craft for a good reason. You might be thinking, well, why do the spacecraft we design here on Earth look more aerodynamic, like the space shuttle or the various rockets we launch up into the atmosphere? Well, that's because uh, human spacecraft have to still push their way through atmosphere. The space shuttle has to glide down. And as we'll see with starfighters in the Star Wars universe, they don't actually push through atmosphere at all. They have different propulsion methods, which we'll talk about later. So just how aerodynamic are starfighters in the Star Wars galaxy? Well, there's a YouTuber out there that I really like. His name is E.C. Henry. He does a lot of these really great starship breakdowns and he really nerds out. So if you guys like that kind of content, definitely check him out. And he basically put up a bunch of 3D models of starships into a virtual wind tunnel. And he assigned a drag coefficient 
to all of these airframes. The drag coefficient is basically a number that determines how much drag your airframe creates. The higher the number, the worse it is. Just for context, the average school bus has a drag coefficient of around 0.65. A Mazda Miata has a drag coefficient of about 0.38, which is actually kind of bad for a tiny roadster. Most modern cars that you're driving around, like sedans especially, have a drag coefficient of under like 0.35. Interestingly enough, F1 cars have a very high drag coefficient of anywhere from 0.7 to 1.4 because they really need a lot of downforce for those uh, sharp corners they have to take. Anyway, moving on to airplanes. The Boeing 747 has a drag coefficient of 0.03. Very good. And for modern fighters, it's probably even lower, closer to 0.02. So guess how your favorite starfighters did in EC Henry's simulation? Well, the T-65B X-Wing got a drag coefficient of 0.45. That's a worse drag coefficient than a Toyota Hilux even if you put an MRS system in the pickup bed. The TIE Fighter is even worse with a drag coefficient of 0.98. I actually looked up the drag coefficient of a brick and it's it's actually higher than the TIE Fighter, so I was wrong with that statement I made before. TIE Fighter is more uh, aerodynamic than a brick, at least. EC Henry then put a TIE Interceptor in next because he wanted to see if it was faster than the TIE Fighter it was supposed to replace, and yes, it was with a drag coefficient of 0.78, aka school bus level aerodynamics. Don't you love it when someone's really nerdy and smart but also understands the lore? Another thing that EC Henry pointed out that I never knew was that the A-Wing shape is actually contrived out of the middle of a F-14 Tomcat fuselage, which is kind of mind-blowing when you see it. But yeah, the A-Wing has a drag coefficient of 0.17 which sounds like it's pretty good, but uh, you know, compared to that 747, it's six times less aerodynamic. So it's not that aerodynamic. Star Wars ships tend to look like they can fly really fast, especially in the front, but what happens in the back of a starfighter is also very important for aerodynamics. We're talking about the tapering of the fuselage, the uh, extra control surfaces for stability, which no starfighter really has. These things all reduce drag and increase stability. I mean, the ARC-170 looks like a fighter plane, except for the back. There is no tail assembly at all. The starfighter that ends up with the lowest drag coefficient was actually the Naboo N1 starfighter, and if you take a look at the tail, it is tapered. So that's point number one on why starfighters are much slower than modern aircraft in atmosphere, and it's because the average starfighter has the aerodynamics of either a brick or a space Miata, aka they're just not very aerodynamic at all. When these starfighters are flying in atmosphere, they're basically fighting their way through the sky against air resistance, putting huge amounts of stress on their space frames. It's actually a miracle that these ships don't just break apart when they hit a few hundred miles per hour. But here's the thing, as we mentioned before, starfighters do not work in the same way as modern jets do. They're based on completely different principles in physics. And that's because of a few different mechanisms on board of a starfighter. First, we have the inertial compensator. This is a device that essentially generates an artificial gravity bubble around the cockpit of the pilot, which eliminates the effect of G-forces on the pilot, which is what allows these ships to perform extremely acrobatic moves and fast accelerations that would normally turn a human into putty or at least knock them out. This also probably protects the space frame from extreme movements and inertia to a certain degree. The next piece of technology I want to talk about are repulsor lifts. You see, when starfighters are in atmosphere, they generally turn off their ion thrusters or fusion-powered engines and use these far more energy-efficient and stable propulsion methods. Well, actually, it's not really propulsion in the traditional sense, the way we think about it. Repulsor lifts are basically anti-gravity devices that push against any gravity well they encounter. Repulsor lifts allow these fighters to effortlessly push off the planet's mass and make extremely precise movements. And so they aren't pushing their way through air from a single source at the back of a space frame like you would with a thruster, which would be a far more violent and unstable activity. Instead, these space frames have a bubble of anti-gravity wrapped around them that is gently pushing and gliding them away from the planet's surface with masses. A lot of things in Star Wars use this technology, from Luke's airspeeder to the entire city of Bespin, and everything in between like Star Destroyers. And so basically, if you're in range of a planet or some large mass, this is what you're going to be using. Repulsor lifts are just far more energy efficient and stable than the thrusters. The only problem is that this anti-gravity technology does limit your speed somewhat. And this also has to do with aerodynamics to a certain degree, because the fastest in-atmosphere starfighter I could find was the TIE Experimental Air Superiority Fighter, or Striker, the only TIE fighter that seems to incorporate aerodynamics in its design. It actually has a top speed of close to 932 miles per hour. And not surprisingly, it marked the X-Wings it went against on Scarif. But still, the Empire deemed it wasn't important enough to roll out in larger numbers because 
they're just not engaging in that many atmospheric dogfights. And so when you see an A-Wing struggling to break the sound barrier in atmosphere, realize that these starfighters are not purpose-built for flying through the air and are more at home flying through space. Flying through atmosphere for them is kind of like a secondary function. This is really the nature of design and engineering when it comes to high-performance vehicles. Every problem has a very specific solution and generally you're not gonna be able to create a platform that is good at everything. And so that is why the A-Wing is slower than most modern starfighters. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. And as usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy. I'll see you next time.